<laughs> okay. Um, that is self-explanatory, right? Should be pretty simple. In trading functions, this and anyway, we'll see what it means as the talk goes along. This is joint work with uh, my student Paris, who's there. All questions should be directed to him. The slides are thanks to him. Any mistakes are due to me. Um, and thanks for sticking around for the last day. So let me tell you what, what problem we'll look at, and I'll tell you a little bit about why um, you might care about it. OK, so let's say you have a bunch of points. These are on the unit sphere in d dimensions. Um, there's some function phi that, uh, so, so OK, if you have a bunch of points um, in the unit sphere, inner products are between plus 1 and minus 1. There's a function phi that takes an inner product of two points and maps it to a real number. That's my function phi. And now we have a query y, which is also a point of the unit sphere. Okay. That's the setup. What do we want to do? Well, um, we want to compute a function that looks like this. So you want to sum over all the points in your collection, in your database, x1, x2, xn. Take the point xi, take the inner product with the query y, apply phi to it, take exponential, and sum up over the endpoints. Okay? Sounds like a weird thing. Why would you want to do that? Well, hopefully I'll try to convince you why you might care about a problem like this. But that's the problem we're going to try to solve. Okay? Um, all right. So, well, actually, let me. So, so now let me try to tell you why you might care about this kind of problem. So, you know, this, uh, this function, which is sum of exponentials of inner products. So right now, just, you know, if you want to think of what phi is, just, just think of phi being the identity or, or phi being a linear function. Okay? We'll, we'll try to put more complicated functions in there. But for starters, just to motivate, just think about phi being just a linear function. Okay, so this is a sum of exponentials of inner products. Well, um, you know, if you have a, a data set, um, this is this particular function is something called the partition function. Okay, in physics, this, this is a term that arose in physics in the physics literature. Um, this is a certain. This arises from a certain model uh, that says that. The probability distribution, the the weight of the distribution on x i is proportional to exponential in the inner product. Okay, and this is the normalizing constant for that distribution. If you know the normalizing constant, it tells you exactly what probability mass you put in every point. That's why the term partition function sort of partitions the probability mass. So this partition function arises in a number of different settings. Let me try to give you some settings where you might uh, you might encounter this. Okay, so the first problem is uh, something called kernel density estimation. So there's a lot of jargon in this title. Let me tell you what. It's a very simple thing, really. So the setup is the following. It's uh, something that arose in non-parametric statistics. Um, you have a bunch of points. They're drawn from some distribution d. And what you'd like to do is figure out what's the mass that this distribution places on the new point y. Okay, so seems difficult to answer this question. You don't know what the distribution is. The various approaches to answering this question, one approach says, let's assume our distribution is of a certain form. Let's try to learn what this distribution might be from the data that we have, and now we extrapolate. Okay? The non-parametric view says, let's try to not assume too much about the distribution, and still, let's try to extrapolate. And one method that people do uh, to doing this is to say, well, Roughly speaking, what we want to do is we want to take our discrete distribution on the data set and sort of smooth it out. Okay, so we want to sort of smooth it out. So a discrete distribution is, is really too pointy, right? It's, it, it peaks at points in the data set, but it has zero everywhere else. We want to sort of smooth out this mass. It's a natural thing to do. And one way to smooth out the mass is to put a little Gaussian distribution or some other function that you like around each of these point masses <laughs> and average. Okay. If you think about what this Gaussian distribution is doing, well, it's actually a function of the form that I described before. It's exponential in some function of the inner product. And you know, this kind of method is used for outlier detection, for clustering, and so on. So for outlier detection, what you'd like to do is 
given a new point why you'd like to tell, you know, is this something that I expect to see, or is it an unusual point, or is it a typical point? And this is not a point that I've seen before. Roughly speaking, if it's close to things that you've seen before, then you'll think of it as typical. If it's far away, you'll think of it as unusual. And this is a way to actually put a number to the, on that and say, you know, here's a value. Yeah. Um, don't you need to renormalize things so that it integrates to one over the surface of the unit space? Yeah, so typically, yes, you, you'd want to renormalize. Now, in our case, the normalizing constant won't really matter. So uh, in our case, um, these functions that I'm summing up, I'm going to re I'm going to reweight so that the maximum value is one. But yeah, in typical in typical cases, you'd want to renormalize. The, the, you'll multiply everything by constant. Okay, but it won't matter for us. Any any other questions? Okay, so so what problem do we want to solve? So this is this is a simple problem, right? There are n points in your database. You want to sum this up. What's the big deal? Okay, so of course you can you can compute this exactly. What we'd like to do is we'd like to figure out, is it possible to pre-process the set of points beforehand so that we're now ready to answer a bunch of queries very, very quickly? Okay, so imagine a setting where you have your data set, you get some time to organize your thoughts, put everything together, and now a bunch of queries come at you and you've got to be able to answer these queries quickly. Okay, and we, what we'd like to do is not spend linear time in actually answering these queries. So of course you can go over the entire data set and sum up these quantities. That would take linear time. Can we do better than that? Okay, that's the problem. Okay, and why do we care about it? Well, of course, because we're in the real-time decision-making program, so that's why we care about this kind of problem. Okay, All right. I had to put the title of the program somewhere, so that's where I... Okay. Um, so let me tell you a little bit more about why, you know, where such kinds of problems arises, uh, arise. And if, if you ask me too many questions about these applications, I'm not going to be able to answer them. But even so, I will bravely tell you about what these applications are. Okay. All right. So um, you know, one kind of setup uh, that arises in machine learning is where you have points and labels. Okay. Think of our points as points in d-dimensional space, and the labels are plus one, minus one. What we'd like to do is learn a classifier, in this case, just a separating hyperplane. Okay, that separates the red points, which are labeled plus one or minus one, from the blue points, which have exactly the opposite label. Right? One way to, to do this sort of thing is to say, well, let's design some kind of loss function, okay, so some, some sort of penalty term, um, that says the following. So, we have these points and we have labels, plus one, minus one. Let's reflect all of the points. Let's multiply them by the labels. Okay. So if we have the right hyperplane, all of our signed points should be on one side of the hyperplane. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the, the normal to this, to this hyperplane, uh, look at the signed point, and have some kind of loss function that tells us how well we're doing with respect to this particular loss function. We're going to sum up over all the loss functions. Okay. And you might try to you know, sort of figure out what this hyperplane should be. One way to do this is to do stochastic gradient descent. Okay? So there are all, cause, there's all sorts of expertise about how you design loss functions. One kind of loss function is the so-called logistic loss function, which has this particular form. And if you do this, the, the gradient of this loss function at the contribution gradient at this point, the norm of that has this particular form. Okay. Um, so what you'd like to do in this sort of setting is you're getting your gradient from a, a sum of terms, right? You'd like to estimate the gradient. And the question is, can you estimate the gradient quickly by sampling points in your collection. Of course, you can get a good, a good estimate of the gradient by just, so the so gradient is the sum over all the points, right? The whole idea of stochastic gradient descent is to not compute the full gradient, but actually just sample a point. Now, you could ask the question, well, maybe some points are contributing more to the gradient than others. Could you actually do better by sampling them in some biased way? Okay. And yes, you can, and the same kinds of issues arise. So again, you're faced with a similar problem to the kinds of problem that I was alluding to earlier. Okay. 
Yeah. So you are applying the norms if the x's are not fixed. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, uh, I, did, I didn't say this. I'm going to assume that here, in fact, I have all points on unit sphere. Okay, so I, actually some of, uh, I won't say this, but I'll mention a result that we can actually, we can sort of reduce in some sense to, from the general case to the unit case. But for our talk, for this talk, uh, you know, everything will be on the unit sphere. So then I have another question about the objective, right? In a certain sense, what matters about the points is not their number, but how they're distributed. Yes. Why is it a reasonable, I mean, sub it doesn't necessarily seem like a very strong objective. Right, so as, as I'll say, um, actually what you could do is you can subsample the points in some sense and just work with the sample, okay? Even so, you could ask the question, do you need the full sample or not? Can you actually do, do things in time that is better than the sample? So you're absolutely right. And in some sense, the, the point, is, the, the set of points, the total number of points doesn't really matter. What matters is, uh, you know, a small representative of, from this distribution. But even that, you could ask, could you do better than the entire sample? Okay. Other questions? Yeah. So in general, in the first slide you put up, right? Yeah. It sounded like you want the xi closest to y. Mm -hmm. Whereas in this kind of variant computation, you want the most violated example or something. You have a y, and then you want the one farthest. Right, right. So, so the exponent negative or positive could be either? Or? So, you're right. What you're pointing out is that um, you know this function phi that you have right, changes things quite a bit. In some cases, you might care about points that are nearby. In other cases, you might care about points that are far away. So, um, you know, thinking about I mean, usually we think about nearest neighbor search and so on, where it's it's the points that are nearby that affect us the most, or kernel density estimation. The points that are nearby affect us the most. But here, it might be the case that um, we're getting most of our contribution from stuff that's some other distance. And so how do we get at that? That's absolutely right. And that's, where, that's why having this function phi to transform the inner product changes the nature of the problem quite a bit. OK. All right. Um, all right. So, you know, we've already seen a few examples, kernel density estimation. Another, another example is in, in optimization, you might want to minimize the maximum of a bunch of loss functions. And one way, I mean, the maximum is not a very nice function. Uh, it's often, it's quite common to take sort of a smooth version of the maximum. And one way to take a smooth version of the maximum is uh, to take the sum of exponentials, take log of that, okay, and this smooth max. Uh, again, has this form that, that, that we're looking at. All right. Uh, here's, a, here's yet another yet another example. Suppose we had uh, the following model. Okay, we had a model where our points are points on the hypercube, d-dimensional hypercube. We have a p parameter vector y. Okay, y is on the unit sphere or or on the r radius r sphere. Okay, and we have a density on this thing, which is exponential in inner product, divided by normalizing constant, okay? And again, we might want to compute this normalizing constant because if you want to do anything interesting with this kind of model, like we want to sample a point from this model, or we want to estimate the gradient, or we want to test a hypothesis, given these points z1, z2, zm, are they drawn from y1 or y2, right? Which is, which is, the, um, which is the parameter? For all of these things, you might want to, you might care about actually computing this normalizing constant z of y. And the question is, can you do this, this sort of thing in time, which is better than summing up over all the two to the d points? Yeah. This is a completely factorized model, right? Couldn't you just do it trivially in n time? Could we? Because it's just a product of factors in each, each of the xi's. Um, so you'd need some kind of xi, xj kind of term to make I see. It. Could be. Uh, I mean, that, no, no, you have that. Possible. But then I'm going to say maybe I, I, I should have complicated the model a little bit and put a phi of xy in there, which would complicate things. So you may be right. I'm not 100% sure, but yeah. So think about, uh, let's say, a quadratic, right? And then what would you do? OK. Other questions? All right, so let me tell you a little bit about what we know about these kinds of things. Um, 
So let me actually come to the point that you made, which is um, you have a large collection of points. What really matters is this distribution, and maybe you don't need all of these points, right? So let's say that, um, so I said we're going to have this function phi that takes inner products and maps them to real numbers. Let's, let's say L of phi is, this, uh, is the Lipschitz constant. We'll express everything in terms of L of phi, OK? Um, now, our domain is plus 1, minus 1, Lipschitz constant L. So the maximum value and the minimum value are separated by 2 times L, OK? All right. So now, our function is of the form e to the power of phi, time, phi applied to the inner product. Let me normalize so the maximum value is 1. Okay. So now all my values are in the range e to the power of minus 2l and 1. Okay. That's the range I'm interested in. Okay. And I'm, let's say I'm averaging this over the entire data set. So my value z of y is also in this range. So one natural way to do this would be just random sample. Right? So just random sample and try to estimate what z of y is. Okay? That's the first thing you would try. Well, so if you try to figure this out and say, you know, how many samples do you need in order to get a good estimate? You need about, if the right answer is mu, mu is now some number in this range, you would need one over mu samples to get a good estimate. Okay? And the reason is, well, it could be, uh, OK, just think about it. It's not that hard. It could be that all of your mass is coming from one point. All of your contribution is really coming from one point. Everything else, uh, sorry, all of your contribution is coming from mu fraction of the, of the points, right? And you're getting 0 everywhere else. Even to hit this mu fraction, you need to sample one of the mu times, right? And then if you want to get a high probability estimate with high, you know, with, with low error, you need the 1 over epsilon squared log 1 over delta terms. So OK. So this means that you can actually ignore the, the, you know, the entire data set and just subsample and just work with that subsample. Right? So henceforth, we'll actually assume that our n, we've already done this step as a preprocess. So our n effectively is e to the power of 2 L of phi. OK? Why is that? Because uh, you know, in order to do so, okay. So, this method is saying that we need number of samples which is roughly one over mu. Well, one over mu is kind of the answer that we want to compute. Okay. What's the smallest possible value of mu? We said the smallest possible value of mu is e to the power of minus two l. So that's our, the size of our sample. Okay. All right. So that's our setup. Uh, and indeed, if we have such a sample, then we can, we can compute the right value. Now the question is, can we do better than this? Can we do better than n in this setting? Right. So is the setup clear? <coughs> okay. All right, so there's been some work on this. Um, and and there's, a, there's a lot of work on the, on the practical side. Let me tell you about one, one particular uh, piece of work, which is sort of quite close to sort of the methods that we use here. So this is work by uh, uh, Massman and Arman, uh, in ICML 2016. And what they said is the following. So they, they used an interesting uh, method, which has been used in a few papers, um, on partition function estimation. And this was sort of in the linear case when you know, it's e to the phi inner product. So that phi is a linear function. So what they show is that this is a very clever trick from probability called uh, Gumbel distribution, Gumbel random variables. And they use this trick, uh, this method of Gumbel random variables, to somehow reduce the estimation of this partition function to maximum inner product search. So somehow they transform this problem so that now what they have is a bunch of vectors. And what they want to do is just figure out what's the maximum inner product of the query vector with these vectors. Okay, so now they've transformed the problem to this inner product search question. And then for this inner product search question, they apply nearest neighbor search. Okay. The kind of nearest neighbor search that they need to do is fairly accurate. Okay, so they need nearest neighbor search with this kind of parameter. Okay, so for those of you who know that what this means, um, 
This means that you're not guaranteed to produce the exact nearest neighbor, you, you, but you're guaranteed to produce the exact nearest neighbor to within this fudge factor in the distances. Okay, and this is a pretty small fudge factor. Uh, so you know, empirically, they, they show this performs very well. In fact, what they show is that they need only root n queries to their nearest neighbor data structure. So that's great. But the flip side is that on the, in the worst case, if you actually apply the best theoretical bounds to what, you know, what, what would give you this kind of error guarantees, the query time is basically linear. It's like n to the power of 1 minus some function of epsilon. Okay? So that's basically what's not. All right? That's sort of the closest in terms of prior work. Okay, so what do we show? So what we show is that if you have any, any convex function phi, we're going to express everything in terms of the Lipschitz constant. Okay? So we can design a data structure where the pre-processing time and space is basically linear times exponential in the Lipschitz constant, and then there's the other epsilon square and log one over delta terms. Okay. And to answer any query y, we spend time which is proportional to one over square root mu. Okay, so remember earlier, we random sampling was spending one over mu. We can do it in one over square root mu. There's this pesky additional factor Okay, and this factor is non-trivial. It's exponential in roughly Lipschitz constant raised to two thirds. Okay, so that's that's the result. Okay. So um, I want to give you an idea of what what's actually involved in proving this result. I'm not really going to get into all of the details, but my goal is to just give you a high-level overview of what goes into proving this result. When new points arrive, do you need to modify your structure? Or I don't take into consideration new points for future queries? So um, we have a hash table based data structure, as we'll see. So in fact, you could throw in those new points into the, into the hash table as well. OK? So yes, it, it should be possible to update. We don't have any, um, yeah, you could throw new points into your data structure as well. So, we're assuming that we have a random sample, and we're building. So you could sort of maintain a random sample of the points you've seen so far. When a new point comes in, you use reservoir sampling, and then you throw them into your hash table. So yes, you could actually update. But for the talk, I'm going to say we just have a static thing. Okay. So is it uh, just notation? It's e to the minus phi then dot minus phi applied dot product, or phi applied dot product? I'll flip phi. No, I'll flip the sign of phi so to make it whatever. Is that what's happening now? Um, yeah. You could take any phi you want. I mean, if, if you want. Phi is convex for this term, right? Oh, I see, I see. Yes, yes, yes. So it's going to, yep. But you yep. could also have linear, like decreasing or increasing with. Linear is fine. It's still convex, but. Yeah. yeah. So but it could be also close or far away points, depending on the, on the slope. It doesn't have to be increasing in linear product or decreasing in linear product. I see. But yeah, if you don't, you're not monotone, then it should be somehow like that. Which means the boundaries yeah, exactly. potentially will get. Yeah, and the boundaries are the difficult things to do. Yeah. Other questions? Okay. By the way, how much time do I have? Let's go until 11.25. 11? 11.25. 25, okay, all right, good. Um, okay, just to, just to compare this to what we've, uh, what I've said before. Again, I'm going to use the assumption that n, my number of points, is exponential in the Lipschitz constant, because I, of the reason I said before, mu is 1 over n, <coughs> sort of the, the minimum value of mu. This is where our results look the worst. So random sampling here would take order of n space just to represent all of the points, and the query time would be order of n. Um, this data structure based on maximum inner product search uh, worst case has quadratic, almost quadratic space and almost linear time. Although in practice this actually works well, I have to say. Um, uh, the experiment show. And in our case we get something like n to the three halves and square root n. Okay, for space and query time. All right. Um, and you know, what kinds of things would be applied to? Don't worry about these, these columns. Let's read this one. Um, 
you could think of just an exponential in a product. You could think of the Gaussian. You could think of uh, these polynomial functions and other functions like this. So you could apply various kinds of transformations to the inner products. Apply methods, and then you got to figure out what the well, you know what the phi is and what the Lipschitz constant is and read what that means for our results. Okay. Uh, and I, I mentioned this briefly. I said, um, for the talk, we'll think of all of our points as being on a unit sphere or sphere scaled by R. But in fact, you can, you can reduce Euclidean space to this unit sphere uh, setting by sort of a fairly standard technique. And this technique was used by Andoni and Rosenstein, for example. Um, also, you know, we're going to actually sum sum up real-valued numbers. We're computing a thing which is a sum of real-valued numbers. You might want to compute vector sums. Okay. It turns out that if you want to compute vector sums, you can reduce that in some sense to computing the sum of the norms of the vectors. Okay. And if you can do the sum of the norms of the vectors well, then you can do vector sums. All right. So next, I want to tell you a little bit about how this actually works. And before I, so I'm going to actually give you the whole scheme now. And it won't make much sense, but then hopefully in the next few minutes, I'll explain why, you know, why it makes sense, how did it actually come about. OK, so in our scheme, we're going to have um, a bunch of different hash tables, okay? a bunch of different hash functions each coming from a different hash family. So you have hash family H1, H2, HD. Okay. Um, so you know here's a hash table that's built using the first one. Here's a hash table that's built using the second one. And here's a hash table built using the last one. In each case, these are hash families. We pick a hash function from the family, and we build a hash table using that. Okay. All right. So you have these hash tables, hash families. Each of them has a collision probability. What is a collision probability? It's just the probability that two points end up in the same hash bucket. So each of them has a different behavior for their collision probabilities. Okay. And then we also have some funky weight functions. So what's going to happen is you know, this is the quantity that we really want to compute. Okay. We're going to sum up. We're going to express this as a sum over our t hash tables. And our tth hash table is, is going to be responsible for this portion. Right? So we're going to take our, the quantity that we wanted and actually distribute it over the t hash tables and say, OK, tth hash table is responsible for this piece. And we're going to sum up the contributions of these guys. Okay. Um, so yeah, so what, what do we do for, to preprocess? We choose hash functions from our families. We build our hash tables by taking our data set and just populating these hash tables. When the query comes along, um, we're going to see where the query lands in each of these hash tables. Okay, so it's hash bucket one, hash bucket two, hash bucket t. Okay, from each of these hash buckets, we're going to pull out a random element that falls in that hash bucket. Okay, that's x t. So these are the samples from the hash buckets, and then what we're going to do is okay. For the tth hash table, we're going to say, what's the weight attached to this particular sample? Okay, that's this quantity here. But then we're going to do some bias correction. Okay. We're going to bias correct it by dividing by the probability that, that y and xt collided. And we're also going to multiply by the size of the hash bucket. And we're going to sum up over the t hash tables. Right? That's what we're going to do. So as I said, that's the scheme. It's here. And I wrote it down here so we have it. But now I'm going to explain why this makes sense. All right. So the key point is that this quantity here, this one, same thing, is actually an unbiased estimator of the thing that we care about. Okay. And the crux of, of the analysis is setting this thing up so that we can actually say something about the variance of this quantity. Right? So we can actually bound things like how many hash tables we need and so on and so forth. That's where all the work is. Okay. 
So that's the setup, right? This is exactly what we're going to do. Any questions? Okay, all right. All right, so um, uh, we call this multi-resolution hashing-based estimators. The reason is because the term hashing-based estimator has already exists, and I'll tell you what it is uh, in a second. Um, some of the challenges in doing this is, we, so we got to sort of figure out, you know, I, I have these t different hash tables, what are they doing? How do we distribute these weights across the hash tables? I said that each hash table is responsible for some portion. So how do we do that? Um, you know, what are these hash functions exactly? What are their collision probabilities? And, and how, finally, how do we bound the variance of this whole thing? It sounds pretty complicated. Okay. And so that's sort of what, what happens in the analysis. So let me give you some of the uh, some ideas in the proof. Okay. So let's start with the very baby version. Okay, so baby version is the following. Suppose we have a bunch of weights, W1 and Wn, and uh, you know, th think of these weights as exactly the, the function that you're summing up over your n points. So these are n weights, and I want to approximate the sum of these n weights, or the average of the n weights. Let's just think about the sum of the n weights. Okay. One way to do this is to sort of sample point i. Not with uniform distribution, but with some kind of biased distribution. Let's sample point i with probability qi. Okay. Let's say I have some such sampling probabilities available to me. Then if I report wi by qi, then this is an unbiased estimator of the sum. Okay. Just think of the uniform case when all of the QIs are 1 over n. We sample one of the WIs, and you report n times WI. Well, that's an unbiased estimator of the sum of the WIs. Okay. And in general, you might want to choose a biased distribution to reduce the variance of this estimator, which is a well-known method, important sampling. And in fact, the best way to choose these weights, these probabilities, is exactly so that qi is proportional to wi. Okay. If you could actually design such a sampling distribution, that's great. This will actually give you a low variance estimator. Okay. And that's the that's sort of the basis for our scheme. Um, the challenge, by the way, in our scheme is that these weights are dependent on the query y. Right. So, so we want to design a sampling distribution which is somehow controlled by our query. Right? It's not a fixed thing. So we want to design a, a method which can support different sampling probabilities which change depending on the query. Okay. All right, so how do we do that? Well, there's this method of um, hashing called locality sensitive hashing. And uh, you know, the inventor is, one of the co-inventors is out here in the audience. Uh, Piotr um, building on you know, a line of very nice work in the theory literature. So what's the idea? The idea is that you take space and you somehow chop it up into pieces in some nice way. And the idea is that um, the probability that two points fall in the same piece is somehow a function of their distance. Things that are nearby tend to fall in the same piece. Things that are far away tend to fall into different pieces. So there's some collision probability which is distance dependent. Okay. Um, and this was this idea was used actually in joint work with Paris uh, that we had just before. This appeared in Fox. And what we said is that if you actually have such a hashing scheme, you can design estimators for the kinds of quantities that I talked about. Um, there, the idea that, that we that we had was if we can design a hashing scheme such that the collision probability behaves like square root of the function that you're trying to sum up, okay? then you can design an estimator that has the right expectation and the relative variance is 1 over root mu. What is the relative variance? Rel relative variance is just the ratio of the variance to the expectation squared. Okay? So if you apply Chebyshev and you say, how many copies of this estimator do you need to get low uh, low error, it's just the relative variance. That controls how many copies you need. So actually, you want to get something with low relative variance. So anyway, this means that we need 1 over root mu copies, so our sample complexity is 1 over root mu. The key thing is that, so anyway, this, this was our scheme. Okay, so what was our scheme? Our scheme was we have one hash family, which has this magic property that somehow the collision probability is 
close to square root of the function that we want. We design our hash table using this nice family that we found. And then we sample a random point from this family. Okay? We compute the, the contribution of that point to our sum, this. Okay? And we weight it by the inverse probability. We do exactly the important sampling uh, idea. Okay? But what is the probability that we actually pick this point x? Well, two things need to happen. One is x needs to have collided with y. The probability of that happening is pxy. Okay? But then in that hash bucket, there are a bunch of other fellows who are sitting in there as well. And of all of them, you need to have picked this guy x. Okay? So the probability that actually of sampling x is the probability divided by the size of the hash bucket. So this is exactly the important sampling correction. So anyway, this is unbiased, and you can actually um, analyze the variance, et cetera, et cetera, which is what we did before, okay? Ah, okay. The scale-free property is actually a little hard to attain, and in fact, we can do this for some nice function. You can do it for the Gaussian function, for the exponential function, and the polynomial function, okay? Yeah? I just want to say something way So uh, this seems, uh, some, somehow in the last deviations regime, because you've got e to the minus, something, and the lot is known about important sampling in that regime. There's some uh, knowledge about what are best important sampling changes of measure. They're usually exponential transforms, and they end up minimizing the, the uh, I guess, variance in a very precise sense. Is that something part of your thinking or not? I'm not sure, actually. I should chat with you after. Yeah. I'd love to chat with you after. So, um, Eddie reminds me that I have two minutes. Um, which is uh, a lot lower than I thought I did, but I'm going to try to give you a, a, a rough idea of what we do, okay? So as I said, this was the scheme. I haven't actually told you how we got it, but let, let me tell you what goes into this, okay? So a few things. We want to somehow take this idea that we had before and generalize it to multiple resolutions, and I'll say what that means. We use something called distance-sensitive hashing, and maybe I'll tell you what that means. And then maybe I won't say anything about the last thing. Okay, so, so let me just give you the intuition. Maybe that's all I'll tell you. Here's the intuition. So here's our function that we want to estimate. Uh, this is our phi. We want to we chop this up into little pieces. Okay, so think of approximating phi by in, in, in this way. Let's look at one of these pieces, a little step function. Okay. We're going to have essentially a hash table that's devoted to computing each of these little pieces. Okay? And that's where we get our, our multiple hash families. Now, in order to do this, uh, we're going to need a hash function which is somehow able to focus on points that have a particular inner product. Right? So I said we're going to design hash functions which somehow are responsible for computing this function. This means that they need to have high collision probability for things that are sort of in this range, and they drop off. Now, thankfully for us, there are such hashing schemes. Okay, so, uh, so we just rely on prior work that actually designs such a hashing scheme. And don't read anything into this. This is far too complicated to understand in a minute. But so there is a method by which you can design distance-sensitive hashing schemes, where the collision probability can be designed to peak at exactly the point that you want. Now, you pay dearly if you really want to design this hashing scheme so that the peak is very tight. Okay, so it's possible. This is what we leverage. And then somehow we put all of this together and figure out what's the variance of this. Now, this seems like a real mess, but it turns out that if we set our weights correctly. The one other thing that I had was these weights. If I set my weights correctly, then analyzing the variance of this is very nice. It, it just turns out to, it falls into analyzing the variance corresponding to the upper envelope of these functions. What I'm saying probably makes no sense whatsoever. But if you read our paper, uh, hopefully it'll make sense. I think I'm way over time, so I should stop now. Uh, you can just this is just to show you there are some cool things in there that I didn't tell you about, and you can find it all about it if you look at our paper. So anyway, uh, 
what did I talk about? You know, estimating things, partition functions like that. We use these hash functions that are designed to peak at cer certain points and fall off. And then we somehow approximate our function by a collection of other functions. There's some technical details in there that I didn't actually talk about. Um, those are our email addresses if you'd like to find out more. Thank you. Uh -huh. There was a key point on that slide. Uh -huh. Future work. Uh, future work. <laughs> yes. No, no. It's it's something that's been on my to-do list for a while, but um, uh, we haven't done it yet. 